Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. This week's episode is about peppers, and it is one that is a true passion food. I love talking to Randy Bailey. I've been out on his farm a few times back in the day when I had a regular day job before I started my own business, and talking to him about how he started his business, how it came together, how he foresaw some of the cultural changes in America's food palette for the eastern half of the United States, really is an intriguing episode. It's one I know one of my nephews is going to love and I think quite a few others will as well because spicy foods and peppers really are something that a lot of us get behind. After Randy and I had this conversation, one of his team members, Paul, took me on a tour of the place. And so I hope you stop by the website groundedbythefarm.com and check out that video because I'm telling you, they have some of the prettiest peppers known to humans. And quite frankly, they are just amazingly different in flavors and looks and the different ethnic foods that they go into. It's amazing to me. Without any further ado, here we go. It's so interesting to be back in Oxford, North Carolina. It's been a few years since I've been here and immediately when I walked onto the site, I remember the first time I came to your farm, Randy, and I went into one of your warehouses looking for you because you weren't you weren't parked out front. Mm-hmm. Um, and that rush of peppers, I immediately wanted to go to a Mexican restaurant and get a chili relleno or something. Can you help me understand, as we're talking about peppers, what is that kind of physical reaction that I had. Do you have any idea? Is it capsaicin or is it just, I know what that food smells like? <laughs> well, it's probably, um, you know, the, 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 the odor out there, uh, it smells of pepper. Yep. Um, you know, smell is a big memory. It is. Deal. Uh, it brought something back that you ate before maybe. I, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have been around a lot of, uh, poblano peppers and a lot of other yeah. kind of peppers and over they're, time. they're very fragrant so yeah yeah, they, yeah. They, they you put them in a room and the, the the smell goes all through the room yeah so i i'm showing my cards poblanos are probably some of my favorites and i do they're great. I, I have no idea why i love a chili relleno so much but i do do you have favorite peppers no i mean i like poblano i mean what's not to like you're gonna stuff it with meat and cheese and Put in a poblano pepper. I mean, yeah. it, there's nothing bad about it. Yeah. Um, but I, I I like serranos. Oh yeah. I like the portability of them. I usually keep them in my pocket. Uh, I don't want to eat a burger without a serrano or a jalapeno. You know. So, really? Yeah. You yeah. put spicy on everything. I uh, well, most everything that, that's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather it be spicy than 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 bland. So. Yeah. Yeah. So what all peppers do you guys grow? And I guess part of that question is. Um, I know you're a farmer, but are you a grower, packer, shipper? Or There's all those weird denominations that in vegetables we talk about, but that regular people have no idea what those differentiations are. Yeah, we're a uh, grower, packer, distributor. Okay. And so that means you grow some peppers, but you also have people who grow f- with for you. And right. so that you'll pack those up and send them out into the distribution. So you work not only on the farm but you work directly with grocery stores and things along that line yeah and when we very first started we were only uh growing in the summer here in north carolina Mm -hmm. uh three or four months of production and then we'd start again next year um as we got as we grew or wanted to grow we knew we had to have a year-round supply especially with the retailers right um and it got to where we had to go make it happen so we, we we started finding other growers to help us we started farming in South Florida, too, as well as North Carolina. Right. In between, we have probably over a dozen grower partners that help us get through, you know, the uh, some of the seasons where we don't have our own crop. Right. Through like, like in fall and spring. Yeah. You're, you're a relatively new farmer. It's not like your family has been growing peppers for eight generations like, right. like some farmers. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about how your family got into farming? Well, my dad had a passion for it. Uh, he was a chemist by trade, 
and he worked a, a full-time job all his life yeah you know but he farmed on the side yeah so we got into peppers especially specialty peppers which is all that we do we we just do the specialty ones um we wanted to do something that not a lot of people were specialized right. in and so we found that niche and went you know went for it yeah so you really are the first full-time farmer in your family in the last couple of generations yeah yeah i would say so yeah your family was my dad's grandfather grew uh, you know a small amount and how did you settle on peppers and specialty peppers i mean it's I mean, there's so many different things you could grow out there well for one thing i, I like them I mean, we started <laughs> with chili peppers you know i I eat hot pepper with almost everything. We're sitting, and, and, and we're I, sitting I at up, his desk, and he has peppers <laughs> sitting here just in case he needs yeah. one. Well, I grew up, uh, my best <clears throat> friend growing up, uh, he was his parents were from Mexico. He was born here, mm -hmm. but his mother could cook. <laughs> and she would cook spicy stuff, but it had a lot of flavor. Yeah. And I just kind of got hooked on it. And when it came with time to, to grow and market something, I, you know, I was thinking other people would like that too. And there wasn't a lot of people doing it. Right. Uh, most of the... The, on this side, most of those products were coming from California. Yeah. Um, so we could grow it here, fresher product, yeah. cheaper. How long has Bailey Farms been in business? We started uh, shipping in 1990. Okay. Really what you're looking at is kind of a lot of that change in American culture, I would guess. There are probably peppers that you're growing now that you didn't know about in 1990. That's right. I mean, it, in 1990, that's when the, the Hispanic immigration started. Mm -hmm a lot of mexican people were moving here for work mm -hmm. and so we grew in the 90s based on you know that demographic growing on this on the east right. coast and increasing the demand for chili peppers when in 2000s when you started having you know your food network uh, shows your people getting into food more or right. being more exposed to different foods and now pinterest and facebook and all that we're seeing more gringos, you know, <laughs> more and more green. There are areas of the country where it didn't have a, a very large Hispanic demographic that didn't use a lot of chili peppers. Now do because, you know, yeah. there's more of us that People eat like a diverse flavor palette People like and me. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> more <laughs> yeah. folks like you. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you my nephew is one of those people who just loves spicy foods. And I can remember when he was maybe three or four years old and people go, oh, honey, don't, don't take that it's hot and he mm -hmm. would ask temperature hot or flavor hot because he didn't want to warning him over flavor hot because mm -hmm. he wanted to eat it if it was spicy and even at three and four years old he just loved spicy foods nice. so so he still does he's the one that every time i am in a place with new pepper sauces and stuff he usually gets one to check out you guys do fresh market to grocery stores but you're also doing some different things now right you do some pepper sauce we do some pepper sauce. It's not a big item for us. That's a crowded space. Yeah. But we, the goal was when we did it is to use our, our off-grade peppers to okay. to use for something. And so um, we do that. It's a way of tackling some food waste that you would have incurred in the course of doing business. Right. A lot of pepper we throw away is just perfectly fine to cook. Right. Uh, it's just not visually appealing enough to make it to the grocery shelf. Yeah, so. it's some of the ugly peppers is exactly. what people call it. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're doing dried. Is that a new thing? Semi. We've got a co-packer that helps us with that. That goes along with the category. Okay. So um, a lot of times you see a dry pepper in your in your middle store. Mm -hmm. But uh, with and, the spice and produce racks now, and all yeah, that stuff. It, it goes along. The, the produce department sometimes wants it also. Right. I hadn't even thought about that. But now that you say it, produce department has gotten so much bigger in my lifetime. I started, my first job was in a grocery store. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the produce department is so much larger. And it is a little bit more than just fresh market. They've added a few more things that go with some of the fresh market items. So. Right. It makes sense that spices would go there as well. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Do you or your wife, do y'all cook much with peppers at home? Quite a bit. Yes. Quite a bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What are some of your favorite ways to cook them? We go in the phases. We do low carb. So we'll stuff a lot of peppers in. Yeah. You know, it's a good way to do low carb. You can you can do a Philly cheesesteak stuff. You can do a cheeseburger stuff. You can do Mexican stuff. All kinds of things with it. It's just a large yeah variety of things we cook and i'm trying to think of that now and well i um, remember you guys have a website where you put a lot of recipes and yeah. stuff that debbie finds or that she's she's created or some people that you've worked with have created right and you have some that are from sort of sweet peppers all the way to the really spicy so people right. who suddenly have something and not sure what to do with it like bacon wrapped jalapenos 
Mm -hmm. a little cheese. That's oh good God. stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You made a point. We we do mini sweets and baby bell pepper right. uh, that are very sweet. So we, we can appeal to the people that can't eat the hots. We're not all about the hots. Right. But you can stuff them just like you can the hot peppers. Yeah. Just whatever you like. Yeah. And a lot of people love uh, cutting those up and eating it with hummus and stuff. I remember mm -hmm. the first time I came to your farm, it was actually one of the farms in Florida and your farm manager I think his name was Mike yeah he encouraged everybody to take a bite out of those sweet bell peppers like it was an apple and there was one girl from Miami who was just like not gonna have it and she finally gave in and she still tells me to this day she used to not eat very many vegetables at all but she looks for those sweet bell peppers and she loves that it actually has the Bailey Farms name on the bag so she knows she's buying them from you guys. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so those sweet bells are, are a little bit different. And I think for a lot of people, you may not realize the diversity of the flavor palette. One of the things they do, though, to check it out is the, is it the Scoville? Yeah, there's a Scoville scale. Yeah. yeah. How does that work for peppers? Well, how that was derived is, I forget who the person was, but 100 years or so ago, they diluted it and put hot a certain amount of hot pepper and to the minimum they you could de detect it that would be a one okay and then they took the scale up from there you can use lab methods now to to determine the heat and and translate that to a scoville unit yeah it's so, a pretty scientific version of it now whereas a hundred years ago it may not have been yeah totally scientifically derived exactly jalapenos have a fairly low rating yeah, yeah, fairly. They can range from uh, 2,000 Scovilles to, to seven or 8,000. And what other kind of peppers you, you grow? I can remember taking some habaneros from your farm once mm -hmm. and having somebody that delivered to my hotel room think that that was so awesome I had habaneros, and they ended up taking some. How far would a habanero or something else you grow, like how high up on the scale does that go? Habanero used to be the king, but now um, it's, it's really not that important. Anymore <laughs> when you have ghost pepper, uh, scorpion, uh, and now the the king now is Carolina Reaper. Do you grow all of those or some of those? On a limited basis. Yeah. There's not a a huge demand for the. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a novelty type yeah. thing mostly. But having arrows, I would say, is the hottest mainstream. Yeah. And how hot are they on that scale? Yeah, a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand. Wow, mm -hmm. versus 2,000 yeah, for jalapeno. Exactly. It's why people like me don't and eat habaneros. We've got some hybrids now that we're using that's less than that. Yeah. So folks can, can get the flavor because habanero has a lot of flavor. Yeah. And, and it's not such, not such overwhelming heat. Okay. So really we just need to continue to try them is what that's you're right. telling me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And a little bit in a sauce is different than trying to just bite into a fresh pepper. Yeah, I mean, when you get into the, the super hots, I don't know anybody really that, that eats them just Straight. for right. enjoyment with a meal. Right. It's got to go in the food. It's got to go in the sauce or something yeah. like that, yeah. Well, so we're talking about how peppers have gained a lot of heat, it seems like, in the last several years. Are they also just gaining, like, market share in the eastern area? I know California and Texas has always loved hot hot foods but you're here in north carolina and virginia and and down into florida and georgia i think you connect a lot of those states with different growers you're working with people there are still loving more and more peppers each year yeah it's a growing category and part of it there's health properties to it too right like some of them have a lot of vitamin c vitamin that's right the green ones have a lot of vitamin c and when they turn colors, like like from green to red, when they're red, they have yeah. a lot of vitamin A. Yeah, vitamin A. I don't remember what vitamin A is good for, but I can... They use eyesight. Eyesight. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a really good one. <laughs> so does your son eat peppers too? Uh, I was trying to get him to come around to it. You know, He's still young. I'm training him. I, I drop a few hot Cheetos in his, in his uh, goldfish sometimes <laughs> just, as, just to... To, to train him and uh yeah he's getting there <laughs> he's only what like eight he's nine years nine. old yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just drop a few in there <laughs> you should try it <laughs> it's fun <laughs> I, you know um i i'm not sure i want to do that <laughs> I'm, I'm on my way to visit a new baby nephew he's only two weeks old i'm not going to play with any of no, his food or his yeah, mama's yeah, yeah, that's but too by, the, by, by the time they're nine 
And they're aware. He knows that's a Cheeto versus Goldfish. Oh, yeah. I think it's a good game to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not anything bad then. How hard is it to grow in multiple states? Is the seasonality make it easier or is it? Well, the transition time is the hardest time. I mean, you when you're in one location for an extended period of time, it makes your logistics and your operation mm-hmm. smooth. But when you're when you're finishing one place, starting in another, getting ready to transition to another really fast, it, it makes it difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, in the summer, we're here four months producing in North Carolina. In the, win- in the winter, we're in South Florida producing from December to May. The in-betweens of that is, is more difficult. Yeah. I'm visiting with you in December. Is now the time you're beginning to plant in Florida, or have you already planted? We're harvesting already. You're harvesting in Florida. We, we started harvesting North Florida in October. Okay. And then we go to Central Florida around Plant City area in, uh, in November. And yeah. And it's still going. And then in South Florida on our farm down there, we, we started harvesting two weeks ago. Wow. And how late will you be harvesting there all the way through, like, February, We go all the way March? through. We do 20-some plantings there, and so it goes all the way through winter and into, into late spring. Okay, wait a minute. I'm thinking most farmers plant at a given time of year. You just said you have 20 plantings. So is that, like, every week you're planting We're somewhere? planting, yeah, for, for uh, I believe it's 22 weeks straight, starting in, um, in the 1st of September. We're, we plant every week. And so what that does is it brings in, you know, for a six-month period, it, yeah. it gives us a spread out supply. Yeah. If you put it all in at one it, time, you'd have more need up front. It sounds and, and great. It would, from, it would tail off in it, the end. It sounds like it's awesome from the supply side. But, my gosh, the headache of organizing when everything plants and when everything's going to be harvested and when everything will go into bags and be processed and delivered – that has to do like a really complicated supply chain management program. It it is, and it's it's far from perfect. <laughs> I mean, you got Mother Nature that you're dealing with. I wish wish more people understood what what goes behind it. But yeah, it, you know, it's not just just farming it. You got to plan it. You've got to overcome adversity. And right. then sometimes we lose crops, and and we have to go seek product from other areas. Right. To fill orders. Right. Because you know you don't want to be out. <clears throat> No, the last thing you want to do is not be able to make good on the orders that you've gotten. You want to be a trusted supplier. You work with a lot of different grocery stores and stuff in the region, or do you work outside of the southeast? How does that work? We do. Northeast, southeast. We have some Midwest customers. Uh, We're in around 10,000 grocery stores. Uh, of various you trains. say 10,000 grocery stores and you just kind of shrug and for <laughs> most of us we're like that's amazing some fairly good sized chains that trust on you to have product for their customers that come in their front door yeah we've got some small chains and we have some of the, the biggest chains that yeah we, that we deal with yeah and you want to make sure you make good on any orders because that's right you would hate for them to have a big rush on peppers and not have any available if they had expected it right exactly because you you may lose your customer yeah you know and and the consumer right they're there and they don't get what they need or want but by scheduling it out so much do you also help avoid some of the waste and some of the degradation of having to hold it in storage or i mean it seems like that's a really good way of doing it so you kind of have stuff fresh all the time (laughs) yes if we plan out more than what we need just to have a buffer right if we end up with too many then we we sell it off okay um to wherever so uh, we do donate a lot to food bank okay they come here every week sometimes a whole truckload leaves here just fantastic stuff that you know we grade out sometimes the crop doesn't come very nice right Uh, but then when we're short we go into buying mode yeah and yeah uh, i remember one of the things that um you and mike showed us when we were on the farm um is there was like a really scraggly area of not not pepper plants it was something else i can't remember um but you guys explained that you were doing that so most of the insects would stay over there off of the crop so you do a variety of things to try and keep the crop nice yeah some of it is is using sort of like outsmarting the bugs <laughs> yeah it's integrated pest management um where we use mild methods mm-hmm. organic methods even such as what you're talking about with the sunflowers 
um, to control and not hurt your beneficial insects because right. not all insects are bad in the field. Right. You got your good ones there that let's take thrips for instance. Uh, you want your pirate bugs there. They eat 20 or 30 thrips a day. Oh, wow. So if you kill your pirate bugs, you, you know, the thrips go to town. Yeah. And there's no nothing to control them. Um, but we try to do, to keep it mild, and we're pretty successful at that. Yeah, yeah. And I would I would assume that the, the bigger kind of challenges then that you face is really weather. That uh, Flooding there's, there's and two, wind and... You know, there's two equal things now. It's weather and labor. Oh, yeah. We hadn't even thought about talking about labor. Labor, you know, weather's always been weather. But labor's worse than it's ever been. Right. And for peppers, are those all hand harvested? All hand harvested, yeah. A lot of labor goes into it. Right. And normally, you have very experienced crews. You don't have people like me out there trying to pick them. <laughs> right, they are. Yeah, they've, they've done a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and people that typically work for you year after year, a lot of those people come in on visas through a work program? We're mostly H-2A now. Okay. Uh, we do have some local help, but you, you cannot depend on that anymore. Yeah. It's just not enough. Just not the volume of yeah. local help. I think a number of businesses outside of agriculture would, would say similar things yeah. is, can be problematic. Are, are you on a better path? Is it worse right now? Kind of where are well, we? Well, H-2A works really good, but it's expensive. Okay. Um, we have to pay based on the ad- adverse wage rate, which is dependent on, like, this county or this region, what the average hourly wage is. Okay. And um, all types of non-agriculture sectors influence that rate. Right. Well, right now we're here, we're over $12 an hour. In Mexico, the, the average wage uh, in dollars is $2.40 an hour. Yeah. So it's we're really at a disadvantage competing. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and also as a business, competing, right. if we had to compete head-to-head with Mexico, it would be um, nearly impossible. Right, right. Unless we could automate the harvest. Yeah, and I think that's this idea of American grown and things along that line. For me, at least, I know what you guys can do, and there are regulations, and there are lots of checks, and I kind of know your commitment to food safety and the environment. And so those things all outweigh the other, but there are different times a year where maybe I can't even get American products on some crops. Maybe peppers may be an, an unusual one. Maybe we can have American peppers almost all year. Uh, you can, you know, but... You know, we have to um, contract with some, some Mexican growers in the wintertime just in case okay. Florida gets cold. Yeah. It, yeah. it does happen sometimes. Yeah. Or a hurricane. Yeah. That's amazing. On an H-2A, we probably don't want to spend a lot of time, but is this where you also provide housing and stuff because people are coming as temporary workers? We do, yeah. Yeah. And so it really does become a cost. Yeah, well, we pay transportation back and forth. Um, it's a really good deal for, for them because uh, they're not taxed right um and you know we don't have to provide their food but you know they get free shelter and and transportation and even the work visas yeah we have to pay for so yeah and you know you're getting good help year after year so, yeah, so we you can work through it <laughs> recruit yeah we can send a recruiters down there to, to find people that's reliable knows, that knows farm work yeah. yeah um and you know we have to weed through some of them yeah but all in all it works well yeah. The the only drawback to it now is some red tape and, and the cost. Yeah, red tape and cost. There, mm-hmm. That would come up in every episode ever, talking <laughs> to farmers. <laughs> if it was a level playing field in, in North America, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, it's not. the differences in cost of doing business in Mexico versus mm-hmm. uh, the U.S. is so significant. Yeah, labor is the number one input in farming. Yeah, yeah. Well, your labor also does other things other than on the farm, right? You have people in your warehouses and stuff that are packing them, sorting them, mm-hmm. bagging. You have folks that kind of do a variety of things along the chain. And from what I know, your employees look really happy around here. <laughs> we hope so. I mean, a lot of them have been here for a very long time. Yeah. These are year-round employees yeah i'm sure some of them every once in a while you guys get to take a few peppers home from work (laughs) do you guys do you guys occasionally have a basket in the break room that people can take take some home we do we have to yeah we have to be careful (laughs) how we do that but we do allow uh if we have um product that they want yeah we usually let them 
take it at a very deep discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I would be one of those people that um, stopping by the grocery store or a Mexican restaurant every day after I left here <laughs> otherwise um, because the, the smell is so powerful. Do you think your son, is he going to show an interest in the business? You and your wife run the place together we do. in a lot of ways. So it's a very much a family business. I mean, it's Bailey Farms and it's Debbie and Randy Bailey. Right. He's so young. Has he indicated what he, does he still want to be a fireman or a policeman or something? <laughs> well, I mean, he's he's interested in, you know, he's nine. Yeah. Right now, it's all about equipment. Ah. And you are forklifts and tractors and all the automation we have back here. He's uh, he's all about that right now. So yeah. So I told him maybe one day we'll make him uh, super manager of all equipment. He liked that idea. Ooh. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have a ways to go. <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah. quite a ways to yeah. go. Are there other things that I should be asking you about peppers? We've covered quite a bit. Um, you know, they they could be a challenge to grow. It's yeah. not as easy as, as, as some things can be. We have a lot of diseases that we're susceptible to, and um, a lot of insects that like to eat pepper. Yeah. Even around here, we have a lot of uh, deer that are pests that they have um, got an appetite for pepper. Really? And uh, so we have to fence off. And and we tried air cannons this year, and uh, we had a, a Facebook uh, storm come because of the noise, so we had to discontinue that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there, there's challenges probably that you, nobody thinks about in, in growing. It's funny. A lot of people in their backyard only grow tomatoes and peppers. Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't really have gardens. They have tomatoes and peppers. And so a lot of people, I think, get the idea that they're all really easy to grow. Well, when you have one or two plants, it's different than having a field of uh, tens of thousands of plants. Your opportunity to get disease started or a a pest infestation, but a pest that favor that plant is much greater. Yeah, just the density of those pepper plants would draw different things in, mm-hmm. or it gets started on one and it can spread more quickly. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas at my house, I have four pepper plants or something, and right. it's not really going to impact a whole lot. If I lose my peppers, I can always go to the grocery store. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it may not be the exact um, type. How do you choose which ones you're going to plant? Do you do that through a system of sort of negotiation you have to stay up on what seed companies are doing oh we do trials year round we're down in in south florida i bet we have over over 100 different varieties of pepper we're trialing i I bet it's closer to 200 seriously Um, 200 there's a lot of breeding that that, that's taking place now it's more there's more breeding going on with with specialty pepper now than ever has been so that's how we try to keep getting better we you, you put them in trial and then you test them for flavor and productivity and and uh, disease resistance and and you try to find a good balance of those yeah uh, and you improve your productivity and the product you put on the shelf that sounds like a perfect win it's a win for the farmer if you can prove how much you can produce per acre Mm, right and it's also a win if you can introduce new flavors and and things like that because my friends who do recipes love to have a new flavor to play with Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's kind of the perfect scenario exactly yeah there's some new things coming out we've got a a a new sweet pepper that's got the background of of, uh, habanero in it and uh, whoa wait a minute it's very sweet it's it's and it's uh, got a crispiness and and it's it's just a it's sweeter than the mini sweet pepper it's really? the best taste of pepper you'll, you'll ever eat. But right now we only have one color of it. Oh, so, yeah. So um, in a package, it doesn't look as good as, as if we had two or three colors. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's exciting. A um, sweet pepper with a habanero flavor. It's a habanero background. They, they come from genetics. You really don't taste the habanero in it. But yeah. it does have a unique, good pepper flavor. And it's wow. the sweetest pepper you'll ever eat. Wow. It, all peppers kind of come from like an ancestor in common, right? So they're always tinkering um, in the field with doing mm-hmm. cross pollinations yeah. with different kinds. Or, you know, long time ago, people would just pick one off of the plant that seemed sweeter mm-hmm. and save some of that seed separately and, and go down a different path. So that breeding today is being done at universities and at private companies both, right? Yeah, yeah. And they, they could shorten the duration of the process of you know trial and error and, and crossbreeding with the genetic mapping technology that right. some companies have now right so what used to take 10 years can be as little as five now i think or less to, oh very cool 
I think if people are interested in growing peppers for themselves, there's, is it AAS, the All American Selection? Mm -hmm. I think they they do a good job of picking out pepper varieties that will grow well in a variety of conditions, right? right? You know the specific environment, so you may be picking peppers that would grow really well in specific areas of Florida, mm -hmm. whereas I think AAS is, they're trying to find them that would grow across the southeast. A good home garden. Right. Yeah, and, and we use some of those in the fields, but not, we have varieties that we use in South Florida that, uh -huh. are, that are, don't do well in North Carolina and vice versa. Right. Um, some do, uh, but yeah, it's it's what works in one place is not guaranteed to work in another by no means right and some some work better at, at, at uh, uh, a, a higher day temperature shorter nights and some are bred more for shorter nights and cooler days really and if you mix those up you get you yeah know, bad results and i would say humidity differences would be a big thing it some can. of the places you were talking about my gosh the humidity is insane around yeah, plant so city the, and stuff right yeah so bacteria uh Bacterial leaf spot disease is a big problem, so uh, we're getting some uh, some varieties with uh, what we call X10 bacteria mm -hmm. resistance to it, uh, which protect you from that. Yeah, and that's really cool because that's finding a natural way for the plant to defend itself, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to necessarily use as many uh, other products to try and control that. Mm -hmm. Right. And you always you'd appreciate for those plants to have that natural plant control. Exactly. Instead and of having to a, do something else. A wet cycle the past two or three years on, in the east, and it, it's helped a lot. Yeah, that's a big difference. And it's so hard to think about all that science and stuff when you're used to just looking at peppers in the grocery store or on your plate, right? It's right. A, a very different thing to think about when you start thinking about, wait a minute, disease pressure that might be in the field and things like that. Home gardening is a great way to get a little bit of a feel for it, but mm -hmm. you still don't get a real glimpse of it at that same scale. You guys share some of this stuff on Instagram and Facebook. You have a Bailey Farms account on Twitter and, and Instagram. I think Instagram is one of the better plays because you get to see the plants and sort of see what you guys are working on. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook as well. So maybe some of these folks can connect with you there. And then that website, I remember Bailey Farms um, website is great because of all the recipes that are out there. I love them. I think there's 4,000 plus in there now. 4,000 yep. right. plus? That's crazy. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, we stopped adding them. It's just got <laughs> what we think is enough. So. I, I, I can't imagine there are ever enough pepper recipes, <laughs> Randy. We'll probably start back one day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank and you. Um, I'll have a few pictures of some of the things that you guys do on the website. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so much for staying around for the whole episode. I would appreciate your giving a rating if your app lets you do a thumbs up or five stars or whatever and you found you really enjoyed it, I'd appreciate you do that. Share it with your friends who also have a love of hot and spicy foods. I'm Janice Person. Love to have you come back. You can find me on groundedbythefarm.com and all the Grounded by the Farm social media channels. Find the Baileys at baileyfarmsinc.com and Bailey Farms on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you.